So I'm the lucky person who gets to follow Senator Cory Booker. <laughs> Thanks for that, Senator Booker. <laughs> so um, I'm Virginia Eubanks, uh, and I'm a Ford Academic Fellow here at New America. Um, I write about technology and social justice. Um, and currently, I'm really interested in how we use high-tech governance tools in poor and working communities in the United States. And that might sound super abstract. But, in fact, um, it's a real honor to be in such thoughtful company today because I feel like I'm really um, embedded in this sort of day-long conversation we're having about policing, about employment, about education and information age. Um, and what I'd like to talk about today is about how um, public services are increasingly becoming algorithmic and um, how that's having really profound impacts on uh, on policy on public employment and on the life incomes, uh, the life outcomes of people, particularly in our most vulnerable communities. Um, and I want to use my time today to really ask some big questions. So does the new algorithmic governance of our families, of our work, of our neighborhoods make us safer? Does it make us more economically secure? Does it make our democracy healthier? But um, I'm going to start at the beginning because what do I mean, for example, when I say um, algorithm? Um, and often people talk about algorithmic policy or about predictive policing or about any of these other things that we talk about when we talk about algorithms without actually explaining what they are. So basically an algorithm is just a set of instructions and for our purposes today it's a set of instructions that is um, uh, implemented by a computer that's designed to produce an output. This is kind of algorithms 101. This is good old find max and all find max does is find the biggest number in a set of numbers. So it just says basically set max number to zero, um, look at the list of numbers in list L, and if, that, if each number is larger than max, reset max to that large number. And it'll run through the list and it'll turn out the largest number in the set. Um, so this isn't actually a really great algorithm to talk about if you wanna talk about uh, alg algorithmic policy because it's um, so very simple and the algorithms that run our public policy are so very complex. But it is actually a great algorithm for talking about the rules of algorithms. So, the rules of algorithms, there's four. Um, one, they must be unambiguous, which just means each step has to be really simple, and it has to be able to be translated into a, a computer language like Python. So there's lots of yes and no's, lots, lots of if and then's, as you might expect. Um, the second rule is they have to have defined inputs and outputs. In good old um, uh, max, um, the inputs are numbers on the list, and the output is the highest number, and that's easy enough. Um, but what about a more complex uh, uh, process? And it doesn't even have to be that complex, right? So what about baking a cake? One of the inputs in baking a cake may be a pinch of salt, but what's a pinch, and how do we measure a pinch? One of the outcomes or the goals of algorithmic cake making might be to take it out of the oven when it's done. But how do we decide when it's done? Is it when the internal temperature is 200 degrees? Is it when the top is golden brown? Is it because it is springy but still firm? Um, and you can measure 200 degrees, right? But like measuring golden brownness is a, is a little bit um, complicated. How do you tell it uh, is different from, say, beige or taupe? Um, so the third rule of algorithms um, is it's guaranteed to terminate, which just means there has to be a finite set of solutions, and the algorithm has to find one and not get stuck in an infinite loop. And the fourth is that it must produce a correct result. So if our numbers and max number span from 1 to 17, um, our max number algorithm can't return 3 as the answer. Our cake-making algorithm can't return a Volkswagen, for example. Um, so uh, keep this thought in mind because we're going to return to it. So basically the idea behind algorithms um, in the way we're governing now is that they help human beings make decisions even as they sort of less transparently often make decisions for people as well. Um, and here I'm going to um, uh, bite the hand that feeds me a little bit and talk about Google. Um, but Google's much debated page rank algorithm and this is a, just sort of an image of how that works. Um, it basically, it ranks the relative importance of different websites by measuring the number of links to it and the importance of sites that are linking to it. Um, but uh, it also includes um, account information that Google uh, collects about you during your previous searches. 
It also includes how mobile compatible the websites it links to are. And also, and this is the one they got in trouble for most recently, um, if the results are Google's own products and services, right? So Google isn't just sifting the information, it in fact is sifting information in ways that influence what you see and what you don't. And we'll find out about this with the European Commission um, suit. Um, but there are people who argue that it sifts information in such a way that favor its own products and services. So, um, so and this is just search, right? Um, this is just like you looking for a cheap pair of shoes on the internet. Um, but algorithmic decision making takes on a whole new level of significance when it moves beyond sifting information and into making public policy. Um, and the example most people I think are familiar with right now is predictive policing. So here's my obligatory reference to Minority Report, um, which everyone does. And probably folks know this story already, but I'll tell it very quickly. Um, so last summer, Robert McDaniel, who was a 22-year-old resident of Chicago, was just sort of surprised when a police officer, Commander Barbara West, showed up unannounced on his home, in his home on the west side. Um, he had several misdemeanor convictions and a couple of arrests. Um, but what uh, Commander Barbara West was there to talk to him about is that he had made Chicago's now sort of infamous heat list, which is 420 people most likely to be involved in violent crime sometime in the future. Um, and the heat list, okay, so not everybody knew about that because I heard a little gasp. Um, okay, so the heat list, one of the things that's tricky about it is it's the result of a proprietary predictive policing algorithm, which means we don't know what's in the algorithm, though it's likely that it crunches numbers on things like parole status, arrests, social networks, proximity to violent crime. Um, so if a predictive policing doesn't quite look like the precogs in Minority Report, Right? It does look like the underground uh, unified command center at the LAPD or predictive policing maps um, that are used sort of across the country. And this is a case you're probably uh, familiar with. But what I want to challenge people to do today is to think beyond policing because algorithmic policy is actually embedded in just about every area of public services across the country. So we've seen RoboCop. Right, we're all familiar with, with this sort of narrative imaginary of RoboCop. But we haven't yet seen um, Robo Caseworker. Um, and I want to give you an example of how these policy algorithms are playing out in public assistance. So in December of 2007, um, Indiana resident Sheila Perdue received a notice in the mail that she must participate in a telephone interview in order to recertify for public assistance. She was on Medicaid and food stamps. And in the past, Perdue, who is deaf, um, would have visited a local caseworker to explain why it was impossible for her to do a phone interview. But Indiana had recently modernized their um, wel welfare eligibility system, um, leaving a website and an 800 number as the uh, primary ways to contact the Family and Social Service Administration. So she requested an in-person interview, and she was denied. So she gathered her paperwork, she traveled to a nearby help center, and she requested assistance there. And employees at the, the center referred her to the online system, which looks like that. Um, she said she was uncomfortable with the online system and requested help. Um, she was denied that. Um, then she filled out the internet forms to the best of her ability, and several weeks later learned she was denied recertification for the reason of failing to cooperate in establishing eligibility. So the most horrifying thing about, um, this guy was called Enforcement Droid 209 and Robocop. Um, the most horrifying thing about ED-209 was that it would give you 20 seconds to comply and then it would just basically pull the pin on you. Um, and this is basically what happened in Indiana. Um, so between 2007 and 2009, more than 900,000 people were denied food stamps, Medicaid, and cash assistance. Um, during this pilot of the automated system. And this is a 40% increase in the three years that preceded um, the automation, despite, this is 2007 to 2009, remember, a worsening recession, um, relaxed food stamp, federal food stamp rules, and a, a massive and devastating mid series of Midwest floods. Um, most applicants were denied for failure to cooperate, like Sheila Perdue, because a supporting document that was required was missing, unreadable, or incorrectly indexed to a case file. Um, missing documents were interpreted by the algorithmic system as an affirmative refusal to cooperate with eligibility processes. Um, and by the time that applicants received a notice that something was missing, and by the way, the notices just said something's missing, not what's missing, 
Um, it was often too late to identify the problem, find the document, and fax it to the processing center. So applicants were told to reapply, which would mean they'd have to wait 30 to 60 days for a new determination. And then, of course, if you're missing a different document, you start all over again. So um, like ED-209, it's sort of a process of you have 20 seconds to comply. So what I want to suggest is that the algorithms that dominate policymaking, particularly in public services, um, law enforcement, welfare, child protection, they act less like, Google, uh, like Google's data sifter algorithms and more like what Oscar Gandy calls data sentinels. They're gatekeepers. Um, they mediate access to public resources, they assess risks, and they sort people into deserving and undeserving uh, suspicious and not suspicious categories. Um, and I'll go out on a limb here and suggest to you that algorithms are actually not very good at sorting groups of people for access to public benefits and services for exactly the reasons we discussed later, right? So rule one, algorithms must be unambiguous and our public services certainly can't escape ambiguity. Um, they're dealing with real people's lives. And I wanna talk just very briefly about the role of discretion um, in public services, discretion's been a real issue uh, historically in the United States. It was mostly white caseworkers' discretion that kept African American families off of public services until the 1960s welfare rights movement, using man and house and suitable home rules. Um, but at the same time, caseworker discretion is one of the few things that I've ever seen actually work to help people create more stable lives for themselves. So our second rule, of course, that algorithms have to have clear inputs and outputs. And so these inputs aren't, um, you know, pinch of salt complex here. They're um, deeply socially and um, hu humanly complex. So we're talking about inputs that include ability to work, compliance with rules, quality of, par of parenting, mental health, right? And we're talking about outputs that are in tension with each other and sometimes even contradictory. So is the desired output of this algorithm to get people off welfare, for example, or to lift people out of poverty? And I'd say those are two very different outcomes. And finally, algorithms have to be guaranteed to terminate, which means there has to be a limited universe of solutions available for that problem. And I would argue that ending poverty in this country is something we have to bring all of our talents, all of our imagination to and not just sort of a menu of five to seven um, possible solutions. And policy algorithms can really cause real damage that's difficult to remedy under existing legal systems. So um, if community members are denied care, for example, for acute medical conditions, it's unlikely that they will continue to go to the doctor and just collect those bills, hoping that at some point uh, Medicaid will pick it up. Um, they'll just stop going um, to the doctor. They'll go untreated. So I want to end um, by talking a little bit about what we can do um, to preserve fairness, due process, and equity in automated decision making. The first thing that we need to do is um, we really need to learn more about how policy algorithms work so we can increase transparency. So the algorithms that determine welfare eligibility in Indiana are considered the intellectual property of um, IBM and ACS. Um, and this is the case with, with most policy algorithms. They're either considered corporate intellectual property or they are um, considered protected information by the state because they don't want people trying to game the algorithm, so they keep it secret. Um, so given that that's the case, Christian Sandvig and other folks have suggested that one way to test these um, political algorithms is to perform algorithmic audits, which are kind of like uh, paired audit studies that we use to uncover discrimination in employment and housing. But even if we achieve sort of perfect transparency in policy algorithms, it might not change their innate biases. So the second thing we need to do is address the political context of algorithms to ensure fairness. Um, so both the Indiana and the Chicago case show that automated systems can be built on unexamined assumptions about the targets of that policy. So for example, certain groups of people um, are uh, more prone, say, to criminal behavior or to fraud. Um, and these presumptions become baked in inequities once they turn into code. Third, we need to address how cumulative disadvantage sediments in these algorithms to increase equity. So all technological glitches are not equal, um, and patterns of digital error, uh, error and response recapitulate historical forms of disadvantage. So last year, the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights said, um, computerized decision-making must be judged by its impact on real people, 
must operate fairly for all communities, and in particular must protect the interests of those that are disadvantaged or have historically been the subject of discrimination. So, um, and finally, we need to respect constitutional principles, enforce legal rights, and strengthen due process. Um, so algorithms aren't um, individuals or rules per se, legally. Um, so it's difficult to prevent and address the damage they do, and we need to ask really big new questions about these. Um, who's at fault if a computer program follows policy, but the outcomes disproportionately impact the poor? Can a computerized decision system be accused of racism? And under what body, right? Um, so I just want to go back to one point, and I'm just about out of time. But back to that rule four for algorithms about them producing a correct result. Um, in policy algorithms, we really have to differentiate between correct results, that is the proper application of formal rules, and the right result, that is the one that is consistent with our most closely held values of democracy, justice, and equity. While kicking Shigla Perdue off public assistance was a correct decision in that it followed policy, it was clearly not the right decision or the just one. And thanks for your attention. <laughs>